Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Bob Haas, and with me here is none other than Team 19564, Mar Marvels of Mass, from Richardson, Texas. They have had an absolutely insane showing so far this year, with the number one OPR and the number one, number two OPR, just absolutely crazy in all aspects of the game. Their teleop is second to none, they are so efficient with all their placements, just the entire robot is an absolute beauty to watch in the field. Today we're going to be jumping into how they make everything so, so fast, so efficient, and their game strategy, all of that and more coming up on First Updates Now. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Get a great gift this holiday season and grab a drone at an incredible price while supplies last at corerobotics.com slash store. From beginning and educational drones to FPV and racing, you'll be sure to find a great gift. Scan the QR code and enter FUN15 at checkout for an additional 15% off these discounted prices or go to corerobotics.com slash store. All right, guys. So, you know, early season, I think we haven't seen a lot of different bot designs yet. One of the biggest things that I think uh, new and rookie teams can learn from is just the general approach to the game. So why don't you quickly talk me through that? So our general approach to the game was trying to make as many robots as fast as possible. We start off with a really, really simple version one of our robot with just a simple arm moving back and forth and to score. But we saw about how fast our production time was. So we wanted to make as many robots and as many iterations as fast as possible. Yeah, so with that, uh, you're saying you built like multiple robots already this season? Yes, we have. This is currently our fourth robot. Wow, that is that is incredible. And so with that, are you talking like full full fledged out uh, robots? You know, wiring, programming, the whole works, or just like proof of concept? Uh, four full robots, wiring, new new design, everything fully fleshed out. Wow. Okay. And you know, this is honestly really unique in my opinion. So do you, let's, you know, let's talk a little bit more about this. How many members do you guys have? How long uh, does this take? Like what type of effort do you have to put in to get these results? So we have 15 t uh, team members on our team and generally the robot design process and like building everything takes around a full week for a single robot. Uh, it can go faster, but it just more and more effort by the team members and putting in more time during the weekdays, showing up every time in building. But this robot was built in around four days. Wiring took another extra day, and then we started coding, and then we got driver practice as fast as possible. Yeah, that, that's really incredible. So let's just jump right in, and we'll figure out how you guys are able to do such a fast turnaround time uh, with that. So let's start with your drive train. You know, just walk us through it. I think there's not a lot known about your robot in the community. You know, we just see it doing cycle after cycle after cycle in matches. So, you know, let's get some close-up shots. Let's talk through it. Go ahead. So our drivetrain is one of the more simple drivetrains possibly made. It's just a direct drive. I'll flip the robot upside down. And our robot is really, really simple in the drivetrain aspect. It's a 13.71 go build a motor directly attached to a mechanism wheel. And the main idea of the drivetrain is to have everything super low to the ground. Our control hubs, all our wiring, we can back up. All of that is set at the very bottom of our robot. So we have a lot of traction when we're moving across the field. That's yeah. what lets us one of the more faster robots. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. You know, and so just talking about a couple of things here, uh, you said you're running a 13.7 to 1 ratio. Is that correct? Yes. Got it. And how much does your robot weigh, would you say? Our robot is around 22 pounds. Got it. And so now a little bit about materials. You know, I've, I've seen this. I could be wrong. This doesn't look like aluminum to me. Is it a different material or what's going on there? So almost... All of the plastic on our robot is either PLA Pro or 0.125 inch Delrin. Got it. And so you guys are using a laser cutter to manufacture that or some other method? Yeah, we're using a laser cutter that we have at the lab. Great, great. And so now talking a little bit about, uh, you know, programming with, with the drivetrain, how are you doing your motion planning, your path following? Are you using odometry, cameras, different sensors? Walk us through that. Well, as you mentioned, we really wanted to crank out a lot of robots really quickly. So we started off really simple with our programming. Currently, our autonomous is um, still using um, encoder drive, using wrench position. Um, and we have very simple methods to make our drivetrain work. Um, because our drivetrain is so you know simple and reliable, we're able to get away with that um, and even cycle a lot in our autonomous. Um, and currently, um, in our teleop that we've been using at competitions, it's just a um, simple arcade drive. Got it, got it, yeah. And you know, there's so much going on with this robot, so let's uh, jump into the next aspect. I wanna start with your intake. You know, it is so, so efficient. Walk us through it, uh, you know, different iterations if you wanna mention those as well, but we'll get into that. 
So this is the, I believe, seventh version of our intake. We've had many different dimensions and geometries needed to make the intake as fast and efficient as possible. Our first iteration was one with that double roller at the bottom. We saw that that actually slowed down the drivetrain while we were getting close to the uh, to the thing player station. And we just saw that maybe a much simpler single axle roller worked better. And we also have a 60-kilogram uh, servo that allows us to pivot it and two axons at the back on the back. Yeah, so so now for your intake, you it's just powered by the motor that you have there, and then you have no bottom roller, you said? No bottom roller. And so have you had any issues like with getting the pixels? And I mean, it really doesn't seem like you've had them. So how would you suggest teams go about solving that challenge? We haven't had much of any trouble getting intakes. It's really just driver alignment when we're trying to intake, if we ever miss. But what I would say for a team to do is try to make as many different intakes as fast as possible. See okay. what works your robot the best. See how it aligns with the floor, and making the surgical tubing just a much longer distance or like a longer surgical tubing is what helped us get much better at intaking from stacks. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. Let Let's talk about that uh, right now. So, uh, for intaking from stacks, what's your procedure like for that? Uh, and let's talk about you know the software behind it. Any sensors you guys use as well. So because we have a dual um, pivot intake, we're able to be really precise with how we grab from the stack. So we actually approach the stack with the intake facing upward like this. And because we have longer surgical tubing, it's able to um, just pick off one being extremely accurate with how many. So the bottom of the intake would run into um, whatever pixel we're not trying to grab. And then it'll only leave space for one pixel to come in. So because of that, we ha we've been able to um, really be really efficient with that because um, it's so precise. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons I was really excited to do the behind the bot like right now is that you guys had just like two competitions very back to back. But now you seem to have like about a one month gap. And I don't want you guys to reveal like all of your secrets or anything like that. But, you know, looking forward to future beats, you guys obviously want to just keep getting better and better. So what plans do you have uh, as far as the stacks go in autonomous? So one thing we just did today is we threw in an entire new intake. Uh, if you see here on our surgical tubing, we have screws on the inside of the tubing to stiffen it. Uh, that allows us to uh, intake from the stacks during Auton a whole lot easier. Because we saw that sometimes it didn't really work out as well as we did. Uh, we thought it would during our Me Too. Along with that, we're beefing up programming a little. That way we can um, be a lot more accurate. As I mentioned before, we're running on encoder drive right now. Um, so we're trying to have some better auto alignment. That way we can be a lot more consistent. Yeah, and so for that, are you looking into odometry or camera or sensors or something else? A lot of what we're doing right now um, revolves around the April tags. We feel like um, if we can get the April tags to work, we can use that not only in um, autonomous, but we can also use that in teleop for auto alignment. So yeah. um, right now, a very simple program that um, gets the job done, but we're still refining as it goes. Yeah, that, that's great. So now going on to your transfer, I assume you guys do have a transfer mechanism. Uh, if so, can you show us that? Let's walk through it. So our transfer is just with the same aspect or like the same parts of our intake. It's the same servos that have the same positioning. And we just go from intake position to straight to our bucket, which has two slots where it can go into. So we have very precise placement of our mosaic. Sure. And so, you know, you mentioned the precise placement. Has that ever been a disadvantage for you? You know, have you ever had difficulties transferring and then you needed to add like some funnels or make some iterations to it? What does that look like? Yeah, so first, uh, there has been many problems when we first started of having both uh, pixels on the same side, and that prevented us from outtaking precise or at all. So that's what caused us to add, add the divider in the middle, and that's what lets us pass through each side and get what we normally do in mosaics. I see. And, you know, so talking about the transfer, you guys are just constantly, constantly moving. Have you ever had issues where the motion of the robot combined with the transfer results and some failures? And how did you solve those issues? We did have some issues like that. Um, a lot of our solutions came with programming. So um, we in made a lot of safeties with our programming, a lot of time delays between different things to make sure that we're not um, doing anything um, out of order. So for example, with our outtake, um, when our intake's bringing itself back up, it has a built-in delay. That way it can uh, make sure it doesn't um, interfere with the transfer process like you're outtaking before you get all the way up there. Um, and because of how tight knit it is up there, once everything's in place, we're able to transfer um, even when we're at full speed in any direction. Yeah, that's that's great. 
Yeah, and so now let's talk, uh, you know, about the outtake. We really, it's been hard to see like a lot of the details of this design. So please just, you know, walk us through the whole mechanical aspect of the outtake and then we'll talk software. So our outtake is one of the more complex parts of our robot. It has a linkage here with a servo at the top of the elevator. And then it has a passive outtake with two prongs mounted back on rubber bands. So when these press against the backboard, it pushes down, leaving us leaving it uh, down for us to outtake. Wow, that's really clever. And so with that, you know, you guys said four full robots. How many iterations has your outtake gone through? And what would you say are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from it? So our outtake is one of the less uh, iterated upon designs of our robot. We've gone through four outtakes. One of the main ones was a... We were trying to use many servos for our first outtake, but we saw that the wiring for that caused a couple of problems with transfer. And there were also... Uh, just more servos is not what we wanted. And then another iteration was when we had the prongs on the outside, but that caused us to drop it on the edge of the backboard, causing it to fall off a lot. I see. And so now with your outtake, uh, I see that it's, uh, you know, completely uh, white, you know, using either the same Delrin or 3D printed or something. Have you had any issues with not having it transparent as like a polycarbonate something you're looking into or really it's not an issue? It's not really an issue because when we have the pixels at the uh, place, we can see from the bottom the two pixels on the outside right here. Great. When yeah. we was there, we can see it as well. Can, can we see the dropping action, you know, if you could trigger the passive mechanism? Yeah. And then you said it just pushes against the backdrop, and wow, yeah, super simple. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's really incredible, guys. So... You know, now talking about the sensors with this, as you guys mentioned, like reducing the wire, reducing the number of servos, that was a huge uh, portion of it. So on the software side, what do you have going on? So with our outtake, a lot of it's, um, as you can see, um, just simply mechanical. So for example, the button and everything like that is um, strictly mechanical. And um, since we have some really accurate servos, um, all we're really doing is um, sensing how um, high we want to place it with um, some buttons on the driver control button or on the controllers. And um, with that, what we do is, um, since our outtake, um, its positioning um, is dependent on kind of how high you want um, your climbers to be, or how high you want that angle to be, um, we're just doing um, a little bit of math to know what angle we need to um, orient our outtake with the backboard. That way it's um, directly parallel, and the outtaking um, is really smooth. But other than that, um, a lot of it is um, strictly mechanical, which helps with reliability. Yeah, and I think the last topic I want to touch on with your outtake before we get into the hang and drone is the uh, slider. So I think I saw a stack of Misubi slides in there. I could be mistaken, uh, but you guys just want to touch on that briefly? Yeah, so our mis we just have a simple machine sliding belter or belted to uh, the outtake with pulleys on the side. We saw it was really, really fast. We During our first meet, we saw that it slipped quite a bit, but we were able to fix that with Misubi sliders. We started off with the Viper slide kits, that Go Builder gives, and gotcha. we saw that those tended to break a bit, and they the belt kept on slipping. So we switched to Masumi sliders, and we found they were a lot faster, and they worked a lot better. Great, yeah. Okay, so Hag, you know, you guys are very, very consistent with your Hag. Uh, let's talk about how it's done. All right. So another aspect of our elevator and our scoring is with our lead screw mechanisms. Our lead screw mechanisms is also what allows us to pivot our our elevator. But they have a double purpose of hanging as well. So let me get us into the hang position. Our wow. slides go up to max extension, allowing us to be at the right height for drone launch, as well as flipping these uh, our, the hooks up. And when we retract the drone launch feet, and then it automatically flops. Wow, that is really incredible. So just talking about that a little bit more, your, is your lead screw coupled to the pitch of the outtake as well as the hang or no? Uh, the pitch of the um, outtake is not actually coupled to the lead screw. It okay. can um, really um, move around and it's just held down with okay. um, gravity. It's just and it's actually software. Helpful. Yeah, you're um, just saying yeah. it's software that makes them go at the same time. Uh, yes. No, um, the pivot right here is completely passive. So there's no motor that's um, controlling this. Oh. So um, it goes up naturally with the um, lead screws um, and falls naturally with them. Um, this actually helps us a lot when we're scoring. You'll see that um, we can push up against the backboard and it'll um, actually lift our um, outtake while we're um, doing it. And it helps us a lot with kind of getting out of the way of the rest of the mosaics. So if you'd I like see. to look at our lead screws right here, uh, can you go up a bit higher? Yeah, I'll do it. So 
when we go to a position, you can see that the lead screw extended up a bit. I see, and I up. see. Okay, so basically your your lead screw is always pushing up on your outtake pitch uh, mechanism, but it's never pushing down. Correct. Correct. Okay. And yeah, let's talk your drone. You know, you guys also have an incredibly consistent drone just all around. Your whole robot is consistent. If you want to talk through some of the challenges you faced with that and how you approach them this season, that would be great. So our drone was definitely one of the more challenging parts of the design of the entire robot. Our first design or our first iteration of it was putting it on the side and shooting at a really high angle. But we saw that that didn't work really well. So we wanted to shoot from as high as possible. And that's what we decided to do. So as soon as like five seconds is left, we just run into the pole, uh, shoot, and then go down. And that's a five second shoot and climb. So we can cycle as fast as possible. Yeah, you know, that that's great. And so with that, I see your drone mechanism is on the, uh, the deposit itself and your whole outtake. So have you ever had issues where like, you know, while you're depositing or you bump into a team or something like that, that your drone, uh, you know, dis uh, unlatches? From, from the launching mechanism, or really that hasn't been an issue? Our drone hasn't really unlashed, but it has shifted positions sometimes, causing the rubber band to be a bit less effective, causing it to fly a bit less. Uh -huh. Got it, got it. And, you know, I'm sure that's something you guys will address. You have a long time, probably build another couple robots before your next competition. Uh, but, yeah, you know, Marvels of Mass, thank you so much. This has just been a really information packed behind the bot. You guys are absolutely insane this year. Can't wait to see your rankings in the uh, FTC top 25s that'll be coming up this season. Thank you so much for this interview. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Ab Haas, and this is Team 19564, Marvels of Mass. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Get a great gift this holiday season and grab a drone at an incredible price while supplies last at corerobotics.com slash store. From beginning and educational drones to FPV and racing, you'll be sure to find a great gift. Scan the QR code and enter FUN15 at checkout for an additional 15% off these discounted prices or go to corerobotics.com slash store. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.